If you look at your sermon notes, you'll see we're continuing this series about 40 days of community and how, how God really wants to knit our hearts into going from just a crowd to a community and how incredible it is when, when we allow God to build us not just as people in an audience, but as an army. I like to say, as God takes us from a sack of potatoes to mashed potatoes, it's awesome. Suddenly in community, we can stand stronger. We can accomplish more. We can see God do things through our lives we never saw before. You cannot fulfill the fullness of God's purpose upon your life without a community, without others beside you, with you, walking your Christian life. As I said, the Christian life has a warning sign. This is the greatest adventure, but don't try to do it alone. <laughs> so we, we've been learning from the early church in the book of Acts, what is it that builds community? What are the skills of true love? We've talked about sharing together and giving together. But at the core of this early church was another component, praying together. It was, it was the, the prayers of the early church that, that made them one. It, number one, it unified them. In Acts chapter 1, verse 14, it says, These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all one in one place. Now, now you know that when Jesus first rose from the dead, the, the Christians weren't really one. I mean, they were arguing about who was the greatest. But then Jesus said, don't do anything but pray. And for, for 10 days, they had this prayer meeting. And God, through prayer, started to unite their hearts. In fact, that word, one accord, it's used over and over. And every time it's found in, in Acts, God does some miracles. The word accord, it means in unanimous consent. It means one passion, one spirit, one mind, all striking one chord together. And when that happened, the heavens opened. The Holy Spirit fell on the city and on the world. And God is calling us into that same oneness today. And you know one of the key ways we get there is through prayer. How many know when you start to pray for others, it's hard to be mad at someone you're really praying for? <laughs> Over the time, you see, love on the outside is a, it begins with love on the inside. It's a work the Holy Spirit does in you before it's a work that he does through you. And it really begins in prayer. In fact, I, I have this for you out there in the blog, and also it's out there. But just we're memorizing 1 Corinthians 13 for this campaign. I, I, I like to test all of you, see how you're coming. But, but the idea is, you know why I want you to memorize? I want you to pray 1 Corinthians 13. And I wrote a prayer. I turned the scripture into prayer. And I just, and this is how love gets written inside of you. I just wrote stuff like this. Lord Jesus, let your love invade my thoughts and mind. Love is patient and kind. There are a lot of people I'm not patient and kind with today, Jesus. Would you please do a revolution of love? That patience will come from my family, even to the drivers on the highway. Let your kingdom come. Jesus, you said envy and arrogance should have no place, not boastful. Would you humble me at the cross today so I won't see myself better than others? Lord, you said that love doesn't keep a record of wrong. It's not onto its own agenda. God, I lay my agenda out before you. If you could be God and lay your agenda to, to come and die, I can lay my agenda. I take to the cross Every record of wrong against all the people I've ever had. <laughs> Would you nail that to the cross so that forgetting what is behind? You said that love doesn't rejoice in evil. I take all the bad reports I have in my mind about people, and I take them to your cross, and I cover them with the blood of Jesus, and I choose to have the mind of Christ that sees them in Christ. Let love and compassion flow. Not by my strength, not my, by power, but by your grace. For when I am weak, you love through me strong. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen. How many know if you start praying that way, you'll start loving that way? It always is something in you before it becomes something through you. So they prayed themselves to unity. They prayed them together into oneness. And this made their witness and ministry supernaturally powerful. Once they began to pray that way, miracles started to happen. 
people jumped up. They were healed. They, thousands came to Christ. Prison doors opened. Peter walked out. One writer kind of comparing the book of Acts to, to churches today, I thought this was good. He said, they, in Acts chapter 2, they prayed for 10 days, and Peter preached for 10 minutes, and 3,000 people were saved. Today we pray for 10 minutes, preach for 10 days, and three people are saved. <laughs> but how many know that prayer brings the power? I believe with all my heart in the notes that prayer is the greatest untapped source of spiritual pot- power and potential in the universe. That literally where you're going in life, I can tell you your future in the kingdom by who's praying for you, how are you praying, who are you praying with. Are you united to a circle of prayer people that pray with your needs in mind just as if they were their own? Then you are headed for victory. How many can say that in your life you've come places that you never deserved to be, incredible opportunities that you shouldn't have had because, Grandma, somebody prayed you there? That you were, you were blessed, not because you deserved it, but you were prayed to the front of the line. Prayer takes what we can be, and it adds what God can do with us. How many of there's two ways to live your life? You can live in your strength, or you can live in God's strength. You can face the next temptation you have in your strength. Guess what's going to happen? <laughs> not good things. Or you could, through prayer, be in the strength and power of God. Guess what's going to happen? Victory. And if you add to that people praying for you, I, I don't know, I have this picture in my mind because I don't know if any of you watched the Cowboys and, and Lord help the kids. No, I'm not praying about that today. Anyhow, but on Monday night, Des Bryant, he catches this pass and he's right by the end zone, but he, he's doing this amazing thing, but he can't quite get in the end zone. And all of a sudden these guards and linemen come up and they, they pound him and, and they just knock him over the goal line. How many have ever had someone who just prayed you over the goal line? Because of their prayers, this mighty force that just took you where you couldn't be. I'm convinced that someone said only in eternity will we see what prayers have wrought in our lives. We will see the good and we will see what could have happened had we prayed. Charles Spurgeon, this great evangelist in London last century and all these Incredible miracles. People came into Christ. They asked him, Charles, I don't understand. Why come when you preach? I mean, heaven comes. I mean, there's other people, they preach kind of your same sermons, and it doesn't happen. What's the secret to your success? And he said, very simple. My people pray for me. In fact, as he preached under his stage, there was a, a basement with 100 people praying for him. <laughs> And every once in a while, in fact, he'd get preaching. Things were going a little rough, and he'd start pounding on there. You know, turn it up down there, guys. Whoa. How many know with enough prayer, the most average of us could see God do stuff we couldn't even imagine or dream? The Bible says you have not, James 4, 2, just because you ask not. Through prayer, we tap into the muchness. And I like this word muchness, even though it's not a real word. But the Bible describes heaven as a place of muchness. How many know when God says he wants to meet your needs, it's not according to his leftovers in glory, (laughs) but it's according to his riches in glory. Ephesians 3.20 says he's able to do abundantly beyond the greatest thing you can imagine, the highest thing you can think of. The Bible says he's prepared for you works from the foundation of the world. He has packages for you. October 1st, 2017, I have a miracle for Janet. I I have a supernatural provision for Bob. And if you can imagine maybe a giant FedEx warehouse and all these packages, and there's some up there right now with your name, and there's not a day that you will face that God hasn't prepared something for you. But unfortunately, many of us will leave them on the shelf. Because to have the muchness of God, the key is prayer. I love Jeremiah 33.3. It says, call to me. And I can you just hear the Lord saying, call to me. Come on, come on, call to me. I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. One translation says that will astound you. That will blow your mind <laughs> if you just start calling to me. 
I remember taking some of my grandkids. I don't know if it was, you know, Peter Piper, one of these places, but I can't remember. But they, they had this massive gumball machine, and there were gumballs. They weren't just little gumballs. They were, they were massive gumballs. And one of my little grandsons, he's looking up at that, and he's seeing those, those big gumballs. He's seeing the muchness of the gumballs. And he's staring, and he's wondering, how do I lay hold of this? Oh, let thy kingdom come on earth in my tummy as it is in the, the gumball machine. And they're just, he's just wanting, and all of a sudden he figures, okay, go to Papa and ask. And, and he gets that quarter, and, and what's in there becomes released. God is just saying, would you ask Papa? There's things that you can't imagine. Prayer is at the heart of what a healthy family is. You've heard the saying, it is true, that the family that prays together stays together. If there was one thing I wish for your home, that as Jesus said, that it wouldn't just be called a house, but it would be called a house of prayer. Prayer in, in relationships pr- creates a bond. You know, they, they did a study years ago that said, you know, the average divorce rate, almost one in two in America. But they found that couples who pray together on a daily basis, that it came out to one in 6,000 that were divorced. Somehow, through prayer, the toxics, the, the, the negativity in our relationships, in our home become cleansed. Through prayer, our hearts become soft and warm towards each other. Through prayer, we have the wisdom of God, the strategies of God. One of the, the, the best books written on this, uh, it's been written by Stormy Omardi, and maybe you saw actually three books, The Power of a Praying Wife, The Power of a Praying Husband, and The Power of a Praying Parent. I, I read them all because even though I'm not a praying wife, I thought I needed to know that too. But, but it's so incredible what she begins to say how her, her marriage literally was at the point of a divorce. And her family, she was about to take the kids and leave. And it was just a terrible situation. And she came to the end of herself. And she, she said, I tried everything. I tried arguing, pouting, pleading, ignoring, confronting, debating, and even threatening. Some of you have tried a few of those. None of it worked. Finally, the Holy Spirit spoke to her and said, Stormy, You've tried everything else. What if I taught you how to pray for your husband and for your family? She said it was a very slow process, and no magic happened instantly. But she said she learned how to gut it out in prayer. I mean, how many know real prayer is a 15-rounder? I mean, real prayer is when you say, I am not letting go, God, until you bless me. One prayer at a time, you hack your way through the gates of hell. Till you get to the heavens. But she said God started to work. And one of the first breakthroughs came when she said, I realized I couldn't take authority over my husband. (laughs) But I could take authority over Satan's influences over my husband. She said, Jesus, he prayed like this. Jesus, you said I could trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. And she says, I will not tolerate, accept, or allow miscommunication, past hurt, discouragement, confusion to bring my marriage to the point of divorce. I put my foot down. Satan, the influence you have of discouragement right now, of hopelessness, you're a liar. Jesus brought us together. Jesus can bring us through. He is Lord. And I put this battle under his feet in the name of Jesus Christ. And suddenly there started to be a a little change and a thawing. And then she learned the next key phrase, you know, is is that God changes you when you pray. And she gave up on the kind of prayers that some of our favorite, God, please help my stubborn, hard-headed husband to change. She gave up on that prayer. And she began to say, God, change my heart. And, And you know, in John 15, Jesus teaches us the four parts of prayer. First is pruning. If God's going to do a, a miracle, he starts to prune your heart. And then it's listening. You have to listen. God, not my will. What are you trying to do? And then it's asking. And then it's standing. And, you know, many of us are right at that place. And what God says, if I'm going to change anything in your life, guess what? First, I'll change you. And you begin to pray. And all of a sudden, God changes your heart. How many know God can give you a heart for people? 
I, I, I just had someone tell me, he said, says, I don't know what happened, but he says, this person I've struggled with, he said, one day I'm driving to work and I just break into tears. I'm just crying. And, and I just have to pull over. I said, God, what are you doing? And, and, and God says, I'm giving you a heart for Greg. That was the guy's name that he worked with. And he says, I don't even understand it, but after weeping all the way, when I walked in, I had God's heart for Greg. <laughs> How many know God could give you a heart for someone that right now you're just hurt with? But if you had his heart, it would change everything. I believe this is so important and powerful that the enemy will try anything to discourage you from tapping into your potential and specifically the potential of you not only praying but having prayer partners in your life. As we've said, Satan, Satan he rests when we plan. He, he laughs when we worry, but he's terrified when we pray. So he comes in every way to try to take this tool away from us. I've been especially amazed to find out that many Christians who love God and serve God for many years, especially when it comes to praying out loud or praying with someone, praying with their family, they don't do it. They can't do it. They, they never developed. One of the shocking ones, and, and Sephora gave me a chance to say it. She's, you know, like one of the most awesome prayer warriors I've ever met. But she told me she did not pray out loud till she was 54 years old even though she had been a Christian all her life. And the only reason she did then is God tricked her into it. She was in a hospital, and someone asked her to pray, and when someone's dying, you can't say no. But anyhow, <laughs> but then all of a sudden that released in her, and she began to be a prayer warrior and lead the prayer ministry, and oh, how many thousands of lives have been changed. But I kept asking, why? Why was that bottled up? And why is it that in most Christian homes, there's very little prayer? Why is it that we can talk about everything, but when we talk to Jesus, we get all stiff and weird? What is going on there? Well, the enemy will try anything, because if this tool comes into your marriage or comes into your relationships, it revolutionizes everything. And so I found out that some of the things that Satan tries to use, he uses misconceptions about prayer. Prayer is for something grandmas do. Prayer is traditional. Prayer is beads or something else. Feelings of intimidation and unworthiness. Prayer is just for holy rollers. <laughs> prayer is for super saints and preachers and, and those kinds of folks. And my, my faith is kind of private, you know, and I, I can't really do that. I don't know what I would say. Many times the enemy comes and says, how could you pray with all the issues you have? You're, you're not, you know, you've you got a lot of stuff going on, and, and God doesn't want to hear you pray. And if you prayed, they think you're a hypocrite. Anybody ever heard that one? And I love the fact that in James chapter 5 and 17, right in the middle, where the Lord says, pray one for another that you may be healed. He goes on, he already knows someone saying, well, I can't pray for someone to be healed. I've got problems. And so in, in James 5, 17, he says, well, think about Elijah. Elijah was as human as we are. And yet when he prayed earnestly that no rain would fall, none fell for three and a half years. You know what he said? The great prayer warriors of the Bible are just like you. They struggle, they fall. You know, Elijah, you know, he, he, he had some, some weird attitudes, you know. One kind called fire down from some kids making fun of his bald head. I mean, he had some issues. But what happened was, in spite of his weakness, God doesn't answer prayers because we're good. He answers prayers because he's good. He loves us. And some people say, well, I don't know what to say. I don't have an vocabulary, and yet Jesus said, out of the mouth of babies, I perfect my praise. You know, the greatest prayers are not intelligent prayers. They're not long prayers. They're very simple, sincere prayers. Because God doesn't listen to your words. He listens to your heart. He even criticized the Pharisees who would pray these long, fancy prayers, but their hearts were far from God. He would honor those who prayed sometimes one sentence prayers like, Lord, have mercy on me. All right, your whole life will change forever. Now you're healed forever. You know, how many of you could learn that prayer? Lord, have mercy on me. Try it with me. Lord, have mercy on me. That could change your whole life. You see, 
What God wants us, and, and, and Sharon, I quote my wife, she said, it's not about flowerful, flavorful words. When you just whisper God's name, his ears open wide. He longs for you to pray. He wants to hear you pray. The world needs you to pray. There's prayers inside of you that if they get released will change the history of souls forever. I remember, I think of this when I think of when I, my first son was born and how much I just wanted to hear him to say, Dad, Dad. And I remember I would literally go to his crib and he'd be there and I'd say, Hey, Jason, say, Dad, Dad. I remember once I said, Say, Dad, Dad. He looks up and he says, Mama. I said, wrong, you know. And I just kept saying, dad, dad. But the day that he looked up and he said, dad, dad. And I picked him and I danced around the room with him. Bought him a present. <laughs> Melted my heart. I think I got him a baseball glove. But I thought how God is just waiting someone to say, dad, dad. You have no idea how that moves his heart. When one of you just says, Dad, I, I sure need your help. I'm tired of doing this on my own. Please, Dad. He will move heaven and earth. He's, he says he'll li even listen to groans in Romans 8, 26. He says the Holy Spirit will just give you. Have you ever just not known what to say and you just go, oh. God says, I hear that. Because at the heart of his plan for you is these things begin to release. Sometimes our personality difference, especially Sharon and I were such different personalities. It was a long time before we could really dance the dance of praying together. And we had to try something. Some of you might have to figure this out. You know, just little things. You just How do I start to pray? You know, we just don't pray together. Well, maybe some of them say, would you tell me two things on your prayer list? And Or maybe it'll just be, What's something you're thankful for? Do you think we could say that together when we eat dinner tomorrow? <laughs> or what if we both wrote two sentence prayers and read them to you? Start wherever you are. But I'm telling you, you will be so thankful if you learn a, a, the language of corporate prayer. God will do more than you can ask or think. Here's why. The power of prayer is multiplied when we pray together. Our prayers are more than twice as powerful they accomplish more than twice as much. In Matthew 18, 18 and 20, he says, Again, truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth, and the word there is plural. It's, it's, it's again, I say God speaks text, and it's whatever you all, that's what the word is. I tell you, whatever you all bind on earth will be bound, and whatever you all loose on earth. Again, truly I tell you that if two of you agree, about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three gather in my name, there am I. He says, I promise you, if you will link up, I will show up. I promise you, if you will humble yourself, if you will, just two or three, if I could tell you about a revolution, if you got a circle of two or three and you said, when I go to school, I'm not going to school alone, but two or three of us in school or two or three at work, or two or three in our neighborhood. But, Will, I'm not going to do this just praying my own prayers, but we're going to link up, and we're going to come together. We're going to agree what Jesus would want to be done, and we're going to say, Lord, we think we agree that you would want this person saved, and you would want to bring peace, and you would want to take away strife. So we say it in Jesus' name, and when he, you do, he says, I'm going to be there. I'm going to come. You watch. I've been waiting for this. My kingdom will come. The most powerful thing on earth is a circle of people committed to find out how to pray in one accord. And when they pray, they make each other's needs as though they were their own. Do you have people like that? I have an 8 o'clock prayer partners and on Sunday morning. And these guys pray for me as if they were me. They cry out for my kids. What that does is it takes what would be ordinary and makes it supernatural. There's a beautiful story. I want to just read part of it. 
that tells us some steps on how to gather a prayer circle. And like I said, my dream is that every life group would become a prayer group. Every, every person in heart for the world would be a prayed for person praying with somebody, surrounded in prayer. Every house would be a house of prayer until we see what happened in the book of Acts happens right here in Las Cruces. But Moses and, and Joshua come together to, to have a, a prayer circle. And I just want you to see the power of this. So let me read it to you. Exodus chapter 17, verse 8. The Amalekites came and attacked Israelites at Rephidim. And, and the sad thing about the Amalekites is they were these bandits. And, and they would come when children of Israel were crossing the wilderness. And they would, they would go for the elderly or the handicapped that were kind of straggling. And they would go and they would... would Rob and kill them. And so they needed a solution. And so Moses said to Joshua, Choose some of our men and go out to fight the Amalekites. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hands. I want you to notice the sword and the staff. Two powerful things there. But So Joshua fought the Amalekites as Moses had ordered. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went to the top of the hill. And as long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. When Moses' hands grew tired, they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. And Aaron and Hur held his hands up. Isn't that beautiful? I want you just to see something. There are prayer assignments, and there are prayer partners. And if you're going to fulfill your prayer assignment, you've got to have a prayer partner because your arms are going to get tired. So that his hands remained steady till sunset. So Joshua overcame the Amalekite army with the sword. And the Lord said to Moses, write this on a scroll as something to be remembered and make sure that Joshua hears it because I will completely blot out the name of Amalek from under heaven. Moses built an altar and called it, the Lord is my banner. In the Hebrew, it's Jehovah Nisi, the Lord, my standard, my banner. And he said, because hands were lifted up against the throne. Isn't that a beautiful picture? Hands against the throne. Have you ever thought of that? When your hands are lifted up, you're touching a throne. And the Lord will be at war against the Amalekites from generation to generation. How, how do you begin to become prayer partners? Not just prayers, but prayer partners that change the world. Number one, you need to, to really realize the absolute importance of, of partnering in prayer. The, and, and the fact that there is both a natural and spiritual side to every problem and battle you face in life. As they face this enemy, I want you to see this, this very clearly. They realize, yeah, there is a physical enemy, but there's also a spiritual enemy. How many know there's, there's natu the natural, but there's the supernatural there is, there is always what's happening around us, but then there's something that's happening, the Bible says, in the heavenlies, where angels and demons and things are being played out. And the only way to be totally successful for God is to have the tools of the natural and the supernatural. Notice, Joshua had the sword, but Moses had the staff. How do you overcome in life? You, you, you take responsibility, you work, but you need to pray. I know some people want to go one side or the other. Some people say, no, all we got to do is pray. No, you got to work too. Well, all we got to do is work. No, you got to go pray. Some of you are trying to run a business. There's a business side. There's a spirit side, I guarantee you. Parenting is both work and it's prayer. And if you don't have both, the full power of what God wants to do can't happen. What we see here is that the winning of the battle in the physical came first in the spiritual. First Moses prayed, and as he prayed, Joshua won the battle. I want you to know this is one of the most powerful truths, and that is, number one, there is the problems that you see, and there's the problems you can't see. Look at this verse in Ephesians 6, 10, and 12. It says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not, can you circle the word not, not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against spiritual forces of evil in heavenly realms. 
He says, listen, if you're going to have any chance in life, you need to be strong in the Lord. And how are you going to be strong in the Lord? You're going to put on the armor of God, and you're going to do it through prayer. I like to call prayer the detonator. I mean, you've got these weapons. You're going to have the sword of the Spirit. But there is one thing that comes and breaks the attacks of the enemy, and that is what happens as we pray. He says, boy, you don't realize this, but you're operating at three levels of demonic powers. There is what we call principalities. They're government demonic authorities that are trying to affect nations and, and institutions. You know, this week we've been praying for North Korea. And how many know the issue is not flesh and blood, but there's principalities over North Korea that Kim Jong-un, whatever, I forget his name, but he's, he's under a demonic influence of powers. And we're not fighting flesh, but we're praying, God, would you warring angels break the influence over that dictator? Break his, his bondage. And God, would you heal him and redeem him and bring him to Christ so that North Korea can be saved. Would you move in the spirit, Lord? Amen. And then there's territorial spirits and family demons that are assigned to wreck families. And then there's personal demons. And some of you know you've got, been attacked in your assignment all your life. And, and these are all at play. But when you pray, God says he does something. The weapons of your warfare through prayer are more powerful than these demonic forces. And when you pray, you win the spiritual battle. Someone said it this way. Prayer is not preparation for, for, for the battle. Prayer is the battle. And the ministry is just picking up the spoils. The first battle doesn't even... You know, when Joshua walks around Jericho later on, have you noticed that? For seven days, he just walks around the stronghold. The people in Jericho thought, boy, what is he wasting his time? No, he's praying and when he prayed seven days, the walls fell down. And all that was done was to pick up the spoil. Some of you right now, you have incredible battles you're facing. And you know how you're going to win. It's not because it's, it's not you're going to figure it out. It's because you're going to pray. And you're going to undo spiritual bondages and curses. And you're going to pray. And then the time is going to come. God says, you've got the breakthrough. And when you step in, the waters are going to part. And the victory is going to come in your family and in places in your life. But then you need something else. You need to ask for help when you pray so that you can persevere. You see, Moses' arms got tired. How many of you have ever been praying about something, but you get discouraged? I've been praying for my kids, but I'm not seeing anything happen. And you hit a wall. And because I said battles are often more than just a day. And that's why we need partners who come and you see, you've got a prayer assignment, but you have someone who's assigned to pray with you. And when you pray together, the strength of each other holds each other's arms, keeps you in the battle until the victory finally comes. I remember when we were just launching our ministry, this is almost 30 years ago, and God called me into missions, and I'm, for the first trip, you know, I'm going to go to the Philippines for a month, and all of this, you cannot believe the difficulty that's happening. I try to leave. We have a miscarriage. The next day, I leave again. I get to Los Angeles, lose my passport. I mean, everything is going. You know, this is just attacking. Finally, I get to the Philippines after two days. And I get into my motel room. And as soon as I get, all of a sudden, I hear gunfire. There was this insurgency and the communists. And, 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 and there's a full-on gun battle outside of my room. I said, boy, this is great. This mission work is hard. And I literally, I just lay on, on my bed, and I'm going to, don't know what I'm going to do. I say, oh, God, oh, God. And all of a sudden, the Lord lets me hear something. And all of a sudden, the room is filled with the voices of all the people back home that had gathered for a prayer meeting just to pray for me. I could hear their voices shouting into my room. Oh, God, help Pastor Dale. God, protect him. Put a shield. And I just could hear this chorus. The next thing I knew, I just fell asleep. I don't know what ever happened to the gun battle because I was gone. <laughs> and then, then I came back and, and, and here this battle was going on. And suddenly these two missionaries from YWAM come and they said, Paul and Alma Shainer. And they said, God told us our new mission assignment is to be your prayer partners, Pastor Dale. 
Now they're in heaven, but for five years he would travel with me. He would stay awake almost all night, every night, whenever I ministered. Suddenly breakthroughs came, and it all led to starting this church. And it, it, but I know, I know I would have got discouraged if God hadn't given me people to hold up my arms. And I tell you, with all my heart, God has called some people into your life. And when, they, when you hold their arms, and, and they hold your arms, and when you pray, you will press through, and you'll see what Joshua saw, the battle is won, through perseverance. And the last thing is I just want you to see, because I thought it was so, when they finished this battle, Basically, God says, I don't want you to ever forget how you win battles, Joshua. Because this was the first battle. Joshua was going to have dozens of battles for the next 40 years. So he says, I want you to build this monument. I want you to build this, 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 this memorial right here in this place where you prayed. You know where they put those rocks and Aaron and them sat by you and held up your arms? I want that to become a memorial. And I want you to name it Jehovah Nisi. The Lord is my banner. I want you to realize that the key when you face any battle in your life, it's not just who you're fighting for and praying, but it's who's fighting for you. I want you to realize that in every situation, when you begin to lift up your arms and you gather your prayer partners and you begin to stretch towards heaven, that God Almighty is raising a standard. Isaiah says, when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Lord is going to raise a standard. And, and, and I want you to know that this standard is going to, to be a rallying point that's going to bring the presence of God and the angels of God to such a point that the battles that you face in life won't be your battles the word here for banner, it's the same word in the idea that, that we get for flag. And, and you know, have you ever noticed when, when an army is in battle and the battle is raging, but suddenly they lift up the flag, and when they lift up the flag, it rallies the troops. And in fact, I wanted to show this picture, I just love it, of, uh, of Iwo Jima, but it's a picture of this idea that our, that our forces were in a battle and, 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 and things were, were not looking good, but someone at a great price, they raised the flag, and suddenly they rallied, and in that rallying, they had victory. And God says, I want you to know something, that when you face your battles, and you hold up his name, it's just like that. As they held up the flag, it was, we remember America, we remember blood was spilled, we remember our greatness, we remember what we're fighting for. We remember our potential. And it takes us to a whole nother level. But when you go to pray, you say, I'm going to lift up the name of Jesus. I'm going to lift up the cross. And I remember the Savior who died. And I remember that he has led captivity captive. I remember that he disarmed the powers of darkness. In his resurrection, he put Satan under his feet. In his power and his authority that he says when we gather in his name, he will call the armies of heaven to our aid. When we gather in his name, we touch the throne of God. And when we touch the throne of God, God Almighty, the everlasting God, the God of the heavens, of all the angel armies, he is there to stand for us, to rally us, to be in the battle with us, and absolutely nothing can stop us or defeat us. He's Jehovah Nisi, and he is your banner. And right today, some of you are incredible battles today. Some of you are facing things. I don't know if it's in your family. I don't know if it's in your health. The Lord wants you to lift up a banner. He wants you to lift up the name of Jesus. And he wants you to do it with people who hold up your arms. And if you can imagine people who say, Mary, Joe, Vicki, those aren't your problems. I stand with you as though they were mine. I won't let the enemy win against you. I am here until the day of breaking comes, till the breakthrough comes. I will stand with you. 
And together, if we feel like quitting, we'll tell each other we can't quit. And we'll lift up the name of Jesus and we'll remember his promise and his faithfulness. And our day of victory, as sure as the sunrise is coming. Would you bow your heads with me in prayer? I don't know, some of you today just say, Pastor, I need Jehovah Nisi. I have a battle. I have a struggle. And I need God to break through. I just feel like some of us, the Lord wants us to make a fresh commitment today. God, no more living with prayer is just kind of a back burner thing. God, I choose today to become a man or woman of prayer. God, I choose to make this my battle plan for my family, for my job, for my ministry. It's not what I can do, but it's what you can do if I pray, Lord, and I choose that plan. And I ask you, Father, that you will bring me into a circle of brothers and sisters who will pray with me in this way. Maybe someone here today, you just really need, the first and foremost thing, you just really need to say, I I accept the Lord Jesus Christ. I, I want this to be the day that I follow God. Maybe you've kind of strayed away, you've you've lost your faith, but today you'd really like, you'd really like to come to Christ. You'd really like Jesus Christ again take over and have his plan working in your life again. Would you ask him in? The Bible says Jesus stands at the door and knock, and if anyone will, will simply ask and open the door, he'll come in. Just pray with me right now. Just say, Jesus, come into my life. I know that I've sinned. I know that I've gone my own way. I've taken back the steering wheel so many times. But I give it to you today. I believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for me. That he rose again. I accept his forgiveness. Please write my name in heaven, Jesus. Please be the king of my heart again. I give my life to you. And just as we have prayed after the service, I'd love for you to come to one of our prayer teams. We have a Bible to give you if you need that. If you're starting your journey or starting over, please come and just let us celebrate that with you. Could we all stand and just... Just as we close this service, if you're, if you're comfortable doing it, if you're not comfortable, don't worry about this. But, but if, if maybe some of you would like to just, I would love for us just to close in, in a circle with, with maybe three or four people. Maybe somebody wouldn't, feel, wouldn't mind. Just turn around right now and just join hands with two or three people for a prayer. I want us to have this in our mind as we go, that we pray for each other. Could you do that all over the place? Just... Say, we're going to pray together and just say, hi, my name is Dale. Whatever it is to say, I'm your new prayer partner. Congratulations. <laughs> you are so blessed. Just, just say to one another, I, I will pray for you. I will pray for you. You're not alone. You're not alone. And in this moment, your battles are my battles and your needs are my needs. And I am going into battle with you. And I'm going to hold up your arms in this prayer. And because we're praying together, we're unstoppable. The gates of hell can't prevail against us. And we lift up the name of Jehovah Nisi, Jesus, our Lord, who conquered death, who defeated Satan, who led captivity captive, who said the gates of hell would not prevail against his church who said the work that he began, he will finish, who said, call on me and I will answer, and I will show you great and mighty things which you can't even imagine. So together we call upon the Lord. Just call and say, Jesus, help me. I call upon your name, Lord. I call upon you. I call upon you for my friends right now. And now we just begin to call out for things. We call out for our families together in Jesus' name. We call out for the promise of God that all of our families shall be taught of the Lord and peace shall come to our families. 
We pray for our children. Let the hearts of our children turn to their fathers and the fathers to the children. We pray for our marriages, what God has joined together. Do not let anything pull apart. We pray that we will love our spouses as Christ loved the church and that we will be one and we will be washed in our marriages with the cleansing blood of Jesus and we will walk in unity. There will not be two fighting wills, but there will be one will. It is God's will in our home, in our family. We pray over the finances of our team right now. Our God will supply their need, and their businesses will be blessed, and their workhouses will become places where God's presence is felt. We pray, Lord, over health in every person in our circle right now. We speak and declare over each other, Jehovah Rapha, the Lord is our healer. By his stripes, we are healed. That the same power that raised Jesus from the dead will help our mortal bodies and quicken them. We pray over our whole circle right now that spiritual wisdom and insight will come to them. That they will know God's will for their life and they will fulfill it completely. We pray, Lord, for the dream and the purpose of their life to be fully fulfilled in the authority of the name of Jesus. I'll just speak after me. Let's speak as if we're speaking to one another. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. The Lord be gracious to you. The Lord give you peace in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. God bless you. Thank your new prayer partners. And have a wonderful week.